Hello everybody and welcome to the Thursday edition of Video Clips and we're going to talk about cancer today and screening and I'm going to start with something that may not seem like it's very much related but according to researchers at St. Jude's Children's Hospital in Memphis, children with non-Hodgkin lymphoma were five times more likely to have BRCA2 mutations than a control group in a study that they just did. The study included 1,380 five-year survivors of pediatric or adolescent lymphoma who were treated at St. Jude's and then a cohort of controls who were not cancer survivors. In an interview with Medscape, uh, one of the researchers admitted that the study showed only an association, not that the gene mutation actually caused lymphoma. The authors note that BRCA2 carriers have increased risk of many cancers, including breast, ovarian, pancreatic, prostate, and melanoma cancers. They recommend that survivors of pediatric lymphoma who test positive for the mutation be offered surveillance for BRCA2-associated cancers, as well as education about risk-reducing strategies while acknowledging that there is no evidence showing that such surveillance leads to early detection or improves health outcomes. So let's, let's um, take a look at what they're really suggesting here. So you take a childhood lymphoma patient, you check his genes or her genes. If they're BRCA carriers, then you start an education and surveillance program. Well, you know what we do. We take off the breasts and ovaries and it's prophylactic organ removal, you know, uh, which is a little bit disturbing. And by the way, there's an article in the Health Briefs about this. We now have some 10-year data on BRCA carriers, uh, gene carriers, who have and have not had mastectomy. And the mastectomy confers a 3% survival advantage, which I think would cause many women to decide not to have the mastectomy if they saw that data. So what we're in for, based on this, is more screening starting at even earlier ages, which in turn is likely to lead to more overdiagnosis and overtreatment. Now, if you base what light might happen on the aggressiveness of screening programs and actions taken in response to them, my first thought on reading this information was at some point in time, maybe we'll test newborns for BRCA mutations and we'll just uh, remove the child's lymph system and then we can make sure that there isn't any lymphoma. And of course, I'm being facetious, you know, but we do prophylactic removal of breasts and ovaries and prostate, so someone's bound to suggest we just start all this earlier and remove more body parts, and it's a step in the right direction for preventing cancer. So yeah, I'm being facetious, but many advocates of screening programs are just not willing to engage in any reasonable discussion about what we're doing. So interestingly enough, on the same day I read this, my good friend Mary Marshall, a nurse and co-worker, sent me a link to an article that was uh, published in the Cleveland Clinic Journal of Medicine. And the researchers who wrote this article state that large-scale cancer screening programs lead to over-treatment. They say that advocates of cancer screening acknowledge that some people are harmed, but this should not be calculated or have any bearing on the screening programs that we develop and the rules and guidelines that we give to patient doctors and patients. Now, it's striking that the articles, the authors of this article, reporting who work at and are reporting in a very mainstream publication, state that overall cancer screening is not effective. They had some data and some charts, which is a little difficult to relate to you, but I think I can give you the idea here for various types of cancer, the various types of screening used, and what the failure rate is to save lives, okay? So if you look at breast cancer and mammography and you take the age 39 to 49 age group, there are 34 deaths per 100,000 person years, and we save four people by screening and 88% or 30 die anyway, okay? Now, if we go to the age 50 to 59 age group, we've got 54 deaths. We save 8, and 85% or 46 die anyway. I mean, this is a pretty profound failure rate. And it's put, uh, the thing I liked about the charts that they were using is it makes it really easy to understand. Age 60 to 69, 65 deaths, 21 are averted, and uh, the failure rate goes down to 68%, but it's still pretty high. The failure rate for the age 70 to 74 group is 79%, okay? So, terrible. Colon cancer, one time sigmoidoscopy, you've got 44 deaths, 12 are averted, and 73%. No, no effect, don't help them at all. Um, annual fecal occult blood test, not to be confused with FIT, which I've recommended. Um, 44 deaths, four are saved, and the failure rate is 91% for the fecal occult blood test. Colonoscopy every 10 years, um, the failure rate is 87%. Uh, annual PSA test, the failure rate 79%, and lung cancer annual CT is 81% failure rate. I mean, if we had a failure rate for delivering on things that we do here, 
of 81% or 91%. You can, no business can stay in business with a failure rate. Only in medicine can you be that awful and still show up every day and get paid. It, it just defies logic, right? Well, in response to these dismal statistics, the authors propose this, quote, and this is with a connection to the previous article, why not just remove everybody's breast, prostate, gland, and colon before cancer arises? They go on to write that doctors already recommend prophylactic mastectomy to women with BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations, and that in 2013, the first prostatectomy was done on a man who was a gene carrier but did not have prostate cancer. Extending prophylactic surgery to the general population and for more body parts, they say, would significantly reduce deaths from cancer. And the number to needed to treat is not a whole lot worse than what the numbers that I'm showing you here. So, in the case of prostate cancer, PSA screening saves one man out of every 27 during a 13-year period, whereas prophylactic prostatectomy benefits one out of every 33 over a lifetime. It's really not that different if we just start taking out the body parts you know, before anything goes wrong. Now, there are complications from prostatectomy, like urinary incontinence and sexual dysfunction, but there's no question that taking the organ out will save more lives than just screening. They go on to write that if proponents of screening truly believe that the only consideration is reduction in cause-specific mortality and there's no consideration given to overdiagnosis or overtreatment, then they would, of course, endorse prophylactic surgery, and the earlier we do it, the better. Back to, let's just start at birth removing the lymph system from children, and they will never get lymphoma. I mean, it's a guaranteed kind of thing. Well, the authors clarify their position. They also do not endorse prophylactic surgery, but rather write, quote, Considering an extreme perspective can help in recognizing our bias towards saving lives from cancer while discounting the harms. Aggravating this, it's impossible to know whether an individual has avoided fatal cancer or undergone unnecessary treatment in many cases. Moreover, they acknowledge changing practices is very difficult if it involves rolling back interventions that were once considered the gold standard. The group also says there are trade-offs with screening and it's important to proceed with caution when subjecting people to medical care that can be harmful, increase psychological stress, and decrease quality of life. Cancer screening, they say, should be focused on at-risk populations where the benefit is likely and should be, quote, an individual decision based on personal values and informed decisions. I could have written that myself. Informed decision making is not the norm when patients interact with most members of the medical profession, which means that you all have to do your own research, and that's one of the things we teach people how to do here in order to avoid harm from overdiagnosis and overtreatment. The reality shows that research, the reality, um, the reality is that research shows that screening programs are miserably ineffective and the failure rate is as high as 91% in terms of reducing the risk of dying from cancer. And that's the only reason to have a screening test unless you just love hanging out with doctors and you grew up wishing that you could have great insurance so that you could have lots of tests and surgeries done because that's how you wanted to spend your adult life. And I don't think that's what most of you had in mind. So a dose of reality that, um, interestingly enough, I had written the first part of the article and I don't think Mary knew when she sent the other article to me, oh my gosh, you know, it's like, this is how I'm going to finish it. But, um, but uh, some other people just north of here are thinking along the same lines as me. It's like, where does this stop? When does the insanity stop? All right, well, and by the way, at our conference um, in November, I mentioned it uh, on Tuesday, we are also going to have Tom Seafried from Boston University, who is going to talk about um, his book, Cancer is a Metabolic Disease. You're going to hear some viewpoints about cancer and information about cancer. I know that you haven't heard any place else unless you've taken some classes from us. So another reason to spend that very important November 8th through 10 weekend with us here in Columbus. All right, hit the subscribe button, pass this on to anybody who you think would enjoy watching it, and I'll be back to you next week with more news.